He didn't have to put the wine there. The point I'm going to argue is that he wanted to make his own death the ultimate final act of purification, replacing all Jewish rituals of purification. Now you may say, whoa, where in the world do you see that? Well, I'll give you three pointers and see if you see it. Number one, he said in verse four, my hour has not yet come. He's going to do it anyway. Woman, don't ask me to do this. My hour has not yet come. What, what is the hour he's talking about? All commentators agree on this. This is not controversial. It's the hour of his death. I'll just read you the key verses. So, John 7.30. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. John 8 verse 20. No one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. John 12, 27, now is my soul troubled. This is Garden of Gethsemane. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, for this purpose I have come to this hour. And one more, John 12, 23 to 24. Here's the connection with death. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies... It remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's the hour. So this is clear. It's clear to the reader of this gospel on the second time through. You must read the gospel two, three, four, five hundred times to see what this gospel writer wants you to see. First time through, no way will you ever see it. Because later, it's like a mystery novel. That's pointer number one. The hour of his death, he says, is not here. Then he goes ahead and instead of dying, fills cleansing jars with wine. As though, I won't die, but I'll give you a parable of it. That's what I think is going on. And remember, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, The blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies from all sin. The blood of Jesus purifies from all sin. Here's the second pointer. Even though He rebuffs His mother's request by saying, My hour has not yet come, he goes right ahead and does the miracle. So it seems to me, lots and lots of others, that what Jesus is doing here is saying no to the climactic hour of his death and then yes to a symbolic parable of what it will involve. I won't give you my death now. I'll give you a sign of my death. I won't purify sins now, but I will fill up jars of purification with wine now. It points you to where we're going. Pointer number three. He tells the servants to fill purification jars. They didn't, they didn't choose this. He chose this. They weren't used for drinking. This must have caused them, well, sure, they don't know what's going to happen once the jar is filled. His mother said, do what he says, we'll do what he says. And then they must have furrowed their brow when he said, uh, dip some water out of the bathtub and take it to the maitre d'. So he chose to put the wine in the vessel designed to make people pure. I don't think that's an accident on his part or on John's part. 
to tell us. This is Jesus' second way of manifesting his glory by giving us a sign, an acted out parable of his own death and his own blood and, and what it would mean. He would be the final, decisive, ultimate purifier for sins. Ritual cleansing is over. Read the book of Hebrews. All Jewish ritual cleansings are over because the final decisive wine blood has been shed and there is no more any ceremonial cleansing. We'll never in this church do anything remotely close to trying to do ceremonial ritual cleansings here. We have one sign, baptism, and we have one meal, the cup and the bread. We will obey Jesus on those two points. That's number two. And keep in mind this. Revelation chapter 7 verse 14 says, they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. If you want to get inside John's head, read the Revelation, read the epistle, and read the gospel. You make things white with the color wine. Number three, finally, the glory of an all-providing bridegroom. We have the glory of an obedient son. We have the glory of an ultimate purifier. And we have the glory of a, an all-providing bridegroom. Now, what, what are you seeing here? Jump ahead with me to the last words of John the Baptist in chapter 3, verse 29. John 3, 29. One last time, John the Baptist extols the superiority of Jesus. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase and I must decrease. So his last praise to the superiority of Jesus is to say that he's the bridegroom and he has the bride the church, the ever-growing assembly of disciples. They're all going to him now, not to me anymore, because he's the bridegroom, and they're all streaming to him. And the first miracle that Jesus does is to take the role of the all-sufficient, all-providing, never-failing bridegroom. Let me show you. Let's read verses 9 and 10. What you're going to see now, watch for it, in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2, is that the groom, not the head steward or maitre d' or main servant, the groom is responsible for this wine running out and being supplied. And which wine he chooses to keep for last and keep for first. The groom is making these choices. Watch for that. When the master of the feast, not the groom, but the head waiter, when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then when people, you know, are a little bit tipsy, and they can't tell whether it's good or not, then, then they serve the poor wine because nobody could tell. But 